the first thing that springs to mind, mm. and the first visualization that I have, so as you mentioned the word hope, mm. the word hope, and we've got Bob Gibbs from NASA speaking oh, this right, afternoon. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, when I grow up, I want to be an astronaut. Are you ever going to grow up? No, okay. no, no, Phew, no, 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 that's good, that's excellent. Um, well, they didn't accept me to become a pilot or to work at McDonald's, so I'm not going to be an astronaut, I'm stuck in recruitment, I'm afraid. But the one thing that you pointed to there was how we systematically, we mm. systematically engineer hope mm. and capacity mm. out of our people. Mm. In a very similar way, the school system mm engineers and systematically yeah. pushes creativity and innovation. Mm. So my question, Margaret, is what can we collectively do mm. to reinstate that hope yeah. and to create the conditions for people mm. to flourish? Mm. Well, I, I mean, obviously some of the things, you know, I mentioned in my talk, but I think, you know, in a kind of more philosophical level, I think one of the things we have to get over is this myth that if you create a super competitive environment, everybody will work harder. And, you know, some people think of this as Darwinian, right, the survival of the fittest, um, but they haven't read Darwin, because it's, you know, those aren't his words and it's not his thinking. But also we know, and I can cite, you know, lots of exper experiments, and there's a, you know, a TED talk on super chickens, which illustrates this better than I'm going to right now. <laughs> but we know that actually what happens when you put people under competitive stress is, you know, people aren't stupid. They quickly work out in any situation, whether it's education, whether it's sport, whether it's science, whether it's business, they quickly work out there are going to be a few winners and mostly losers. So they don't want to be one of the losers. And if they can't win naturally, they will win unnaturally. So what have we seen in education? Rising rates of plagiarism, cheating at exams and the taking of performance enhancing drugs like Adderall and Ativan. We have seen exactly the same thing in sports. Where are the sports where people don't cheat? They're the ones with low stakes, right? But all the other sports, people cheat. Or, you know, they injure themselves catastrophically because they're so desperate to win. In science, we've seen an increasing rate of faked results and a rising rate of retractions, right? What people have figured out is if winning is everything, and I can't win the right way, I'll do it the wrong way. And so I think we've got to get over this idea that, well, if we just make everybody compete with each other, and this is exactly what forced ranking does, right? Yeah. Then we'll do better. And it's interesting, because I did some work at GE about two years ago, and I said, oh, I've always wanted to meet you guys, you know, because you, evangelized forced ranking all over the world. And one reason so many companies do forced ranking is that you are a model of leadership, so everybody copied you. How come you've thrown it out? Hmm. And they said, well, somebody somewhere got around to crunching the data, and we discovered it didn't work. Now, they haven't been as loud about that as they were about its benefits at the beginning. So there are still hundreds of global companies that do forced ranking, mm. completely oblivious to the fact that it doesn't work. It means they just ship out 5 or 10% of their workforce every year because it looks like they're doing something. You mentioned the data at GE, mm. and earlier on I used the, the word factivism. Actually, I borrowed it from Bono. Don't <laughs> tell him. Uh, I know you guys do the circuit. Um, but taking data and activating change with the data mm. can be a very powerful yeah. tool. Um, but I know you once argued for not having, like, what you said was, well, having excellence was not enough. And there's two things that you mm. pointed to as a particular cohesion or glue mm. to create collaboration. Mm. One was to trust people, mm. and the other one was to be trustworthy. Right. How do you become trustworthy in a mm -hmm. transient, changing, nature of work that yeah. exists today? Well, actually, I think it's, it's a great question. I think the transient nature of work actually makes it more important to be trustworthy than ever. Because even if you're going to change jobs every two or three years, yeah. what you're carrying around in your briefcase isn't your resume, it's your reputation. 
Okay. And people, and this is especially true in Ireland, where everybody talks to everybody, right? Yeah. Which is one of the great things I love about Ireland, which is people talk to each other still, even after phones. It's brilliant. <laughs> um, but people's reputation catches up with them if they're not trustworthy. And so, you know, you have to recognize that every conversation you have with, every, with somebody, every recommendation you give to somebody, every time you diss someone, you know, that or every time someone disses you, you know, that's a sort of plus or minus in your reputation. So I think, you know, and I think this is something we need to be much more vocal about in talking about at work and with our kids, which is you are trustworthy if you are consistent, if you are benevolent, if you wish other people well, right? If you have integrity, which means I act the same way when nobody's looking, right? Nice, yeah. And, you know, so I think those are really the building blocks of trust, that I don't care if anybody overhears my conversation, they're not gonna hear something that I'm embarrassed by. Yeah. I'm going to honor my relationships. You remind me of two things, Margaret. I was speaking with Neve, EY, just outside, and, and Neve mentioned uh, to presume positive intent mm. and how important yeah. that is. And you also remind me of something that, that I learned on, on stage here, in fact, when we're talking about leadership, and somebody gave their takeaway as this, to always be conscious of other people's of experience of you in your presence mm. every time. Yeah. And that's what they remember. So this is really interesting. You know, you can't see yourself, right? You can't see your own eyes, except in a reflection. And the reflection is from other people. Nice. And I think this is particularly important for people who have power, mm. right? Because most leaders, I mean, I mentor a number of senior and chief execs, and they're very unaware of their power. And they think that's cute because they think it means they don't care. Well, actually, it's not, it's not cute, it's naive and stupid, because everybody else knows they have power, so acting like they're just an ordinary Joe, is just, it's dissembling. Yeah. You have to be super aware that when you walk in the room, people change. You have to be super aware of the fact that they are going to try to tell you what they think you want to hear. You have to be aware of the fact that they're kind of afraid of you, and they're a little intimidated by you, and your work, is to make them feel unafraid and safe. The conditions to have honest, frank, mm. creative comfort. Yeah. Well, so I think this is really important because, um, you know, I make a big deal about social capital. Mm -hmm. I think it is a big deal. But, you know, some people quite rightly say, well, why? You know, why, why is it such a big deal? I mean, I can see it's more fun to work a nice place than a nasty place. But here's the thing, you know, I've worked in creative industries all my life, radio, television, high tech. Every good idea started out as a crap idea. Right? <laughs> it started out as a kind of random, wild ass, I wonder what would happen if, or what if he did, or, you know, this really doesn't work. Would it work better if we did this, right? It does not start the way it's in. The mythology is you jump out of your bathtub and you've solved the problems of the world, right? It doesn't work like that. I promise you, it doesn't work like that. It starts with a bad idea. You share it with people you trust. And they may say, Margaret, you really need to get a good night's sleep. Or they say, oh, that's kind of interesting. What, you know, read this or go talk to that person. Or what about if you did it this way or if you added that? And slowly but surely, as you have those conversations, or somebody says, no, don't do that, do this, and you have a big argument about it, and you go away and you think, damn it, they're right. <laughs> That's how bad ideas turn into great ideas. But they don't have, that does not happen if you don't have the people with whom you can do it safely and comfortably, knowing that as you're both standing there screaming at each other, you're doing it because you care. You're not doing it because you want to win. You're just really passionate, and you want this idea that's kind of nearly almost there to really break through and become kind of perfectly formed. And the thing that's so 
kind of frustrating but delightful, is once it is perfectly formed, it looks so bloody obvious, but it never starts that way. So if you don't have those people and that culture in which you can do all that, you may have lots of bad ideas, but they're not going to go anywhere. My colleague Aidy said to me, he goes, there's no such thing as a stupid question, but I've come so close so mm. often. Mm. Um, but like that, it's probably a developmental thing as well, isn't it? Like if people are simply an echo chamber mm -hmm. for your view or opinion, it's not going to change. Yeah. And it needs to be challenged. And, um, and that's part of a problem of power, which is, you know, unless you take steps to change it, you are in an echo chamber because people will suck up to you. But I, um, you know, willful blindness, I wrote about the story of a uh, medical researcher in the UK who did the world's biggest ever ch study in childhood cancer. And it was deeply, deeply controversial because she found that one major cause of childhood cancers was in the 50s, it was orthodox to x-ray women who were pregnant. And the whole medical establishment came down and said she was wrong, she was wrong, she was wrong. And she fought this battle for 25 years. And, you know, and now everybody knows it's wrong. But the thing that fascinated me about the story was I kept thinking, God, blimey, how do you keep going for 25 years? Yeah. And what I discovered is she had a collaborator named George Neal. And George was exactly the opposite of Alice Stewart, the doctor. Alice was very gregarious and outgoing. Everybody said she was great company. And George was what we would call a nerd. <laughs> very introverted, preferred number of people. But he said one brilliant thing about his work with her. He said, my job is to prove that she's wrong. Because if I can't, she knows she can keep fighting. A common purpose, though. Yeah. So common purpose. But he knew that actually constantly testing the idea, constantly challenging her. Couldn't it be this? Couldn't it be that? Couldn't there be another cause? That's what kept her going. That's why we don't x-ray pregnant women anymore. Very good. Very good. Really good story, Margaret. Can I bring it back to social capital? Mm. Like what I visualize when you talk about social capital so eloquently, like the human capital to build mm. blocks in organizations, and the social capital, the glue or gel mm. that binds them, um, and creates the foundation for a company to scale. Mm. So if you think of that physical um, image, for companies who are building the house while living in it, yeah. small <laughs> startup, scrappy, yeah. it evolves, it emerges, right? Yeah, it it does. happens, yeah. it exists. Um, for large organizations mm. who are one or two stories up in mm. terms of their growth, and if it's starting to crumble, mm. how do they prioritize the time that it takes yeah. to repair that yeah. mortar yeah. in the organization? Because it does take time. Yeah, great question. Um, people often say to me, well, Margaret, look, we've got earnings, we've got innovation, we've got diversity, we've got uh, environmental issues, you know, we've got all this stuff we have mm. to deal with. And you're telling me I have to take time for coffee breaks and lunches and all this jazz. Geez, when did you have a real job, right? And, and it's a, you know, it's a fair point. And here's my answer. We also, time is the most precious thing you have in a company. You can replace people, you can replace technology, you can replace cash, you can replace products, you can replace buildings, you can replace anything. You can't replace time. When it's gone, it's gone. Mm -hmm. right? We manage time so badly, even though it is the most precious asset we have. There's a fantastic study of a company that decided that you know, they, they kept logs of how people were working. And they just break your heart, right? I come into work at 8 because I have a big piece of work I want to do. And I think I'll get some quiet time to do it. But then so-and-so asks me for this. And then I have a meeting. And then there's a call. And then you know, there's an IT thing, which means I can't use my computer for 45 minutes as we upgrade to some operating system that's worse than the one before. And you know, all this sort of stuff. And this guy by 4.30 is finally starting you know, when he's tired yeah. and jagged on the big piece of work. So they said, OK, this is terrible. It's unproductive. Everybody's a jangle. You know, and that's even before phones and all this crap. Um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, between 10 and 12, there will be no interruptions. No meetings, no calls, no 
you know, wandering over to somebody's desk, quiet time. That's it. Nobody, not even bosses, can interrupt. 60% increase in productivity. Yeah. Didn't cost a cent. Now, I have often suggested this to CEOs who blanch at the concept, because what's the point of power if I can't interrupt people, right? So you have bosses who just dive bomb their people all the time. What about this? What about that? Firing off emails at 2 o'clock in the morning. I've been that boss. I know, right? And it's a catastrophe. We pay people to think, and then we give them no time to do it. And I have run into companies that do variants on this mm. quiet time stuff. So they'll say, no meetings before noon. We know statistically people do better work in the morning than the afternoon. So the thinking work, can, there's plenty of time to do it in the morning, and there aren't going to be any meetings. You know, or they'll say, no meetings after 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, people have time to really collect their thoughts before they go home. Instead of doing what a lot of us used to do, a lot of us still do, I'm sure, which is thinking, oh, for God's sake, I'm going home now mm. to get my work done. Most of my clients work on Sundays. They're working six-day weeks. You know, because all of this stuff is happening, because we manage time so poorly. And I live for the day where I go and talk to a company or an executive committee or a senior leadership team and anybody, anybody, talks about how they manage time. And it's the single most valuable thing they have. People talk, Margaret, about work-life balance. Mm. I think full stop, it's your life. Mm -hmm. it, exactly, work absolutely. And that's yeah. the time and time. Yeah, yeah, part. yeah. And you, know, and, and, you know, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm a neighbor. You know, I'm all of those people. Mm. That's all of my life, as well as my work. And I think if you're doing work you love, you don't really care about the balance. I mean, I'm the most imbalanced person I know. You know? <laughs> but, but you start caring about the balance when one part of your life feels really creative and great, and the other part doesn't. That's when you start counting the hours. Funny you mentioned the word care. Like to care about that. Mm. A lot of what you spoke about, just listening to what you were saying, it's not my questions, but it describes and it feels like we're trying to replicate things that are usually innate in values that we have mm. in a family unit. Yeah. So yeah. if you look at the common purpose, it's the well-being, yeah. the development of our children as parents. Yeah. And no two kids are the same. I've got three who are very, very different. Right. One's a hustler. Um, yeah. But of three, we're very, very different. Yeah. And each of them need a very different That's right. level of treatment, love, and um, support. You never treat, think of treating them all exactly the same way. You want to see the middle one. I'm not joking, <laughs> Margaret. Yeah. But you can't. So I'm yeah. thinking, like, how do we take that into the workplace? And how do we, like, can we influence kind of group thinking? Or is it, is it, is it a... A, is it man marking? Is it a one to one game? Mm. That's an interesting question. I mean, Bill Gore, who started WL Gore, and they make Gore Tex, among oh. a million other things. Uh, and this company has more patents per employee than any other company in the world. So if you take that as a mark for creativity, this is a super creative company. Yeah. They do a really interesting thing. They won't let any one of their business sites become more than 120 people. So everybody does know everybody. For yours. Um, and if it, if it, for business reasons, needs to get bigger, they create another one, another 120 people group. Um, so they really believe in this one-to-one -one stuff, where you know every single person you work with. Um, ING, the Dutch bank, increasingly puts people into what they, they call tribes. So these will be multidisciplinary teams you know, they've kind of worked together quite long term on any number of projects. So they're not project teams, yeah. right? So they're build, they're kind of um, constructing the company into these smaller units. The nursing organization that I talked about in the Netherlands, it now has employees 10,000 nurses. What that means is they have 1,000 groups of 10. The whole thing is, is supported by a back office of 32 people. Yeah. Right. But they're keeping 
the group small because they believe that within those small groups you can build a huge amount of trust, safety, respect, benevolence, competence. Partly because, you know, when somebody discovers something, they share it. Yeah. Or when they hit a problem, they can bring the problem to the group and say, what do we, what do we think? And then if the group can't figure it out, they can take it to the back office to say, can you ask all the other groups in case anybody else knows? So they're very short lines of communication. You know, they're not kind of all around the houses. And people feel, this is really important, I think, because these groups are smaller, people feel deeply accountable. Mm -hmm. They don't just think, well, somebody will do it, right? Somebody will put the fire out. You know, it's their team, it's their patient, it's their responsibility. And responsibility comes with accountability. Exactly. And I think, you know, we've, especially after the financial crisis, we've really wrestled with this idea of accountability yeah. and responsibility. And I think, you know, because I work with lots of companies around the world, they're still wrestling with it. How much of it is rules and how much of it isn't? And I think, you know, to a significant degree, people feel responsible for the things that they do or have some influence over. Mm. And once with hierarchy and bureaucracy you take those things out, asking them to be accountable is just a waste of time. Because if I didn't, if I didn't have any say in what it was or how it was, how can I be responsible for it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And my colleague Malvina mentioned in the last panel, Margaret, that the shift from control and command to mm -hmm. climate control, mm -hmm. creating the climate for people to have autonomy and to be accountable mm -hmm. for what they deliver. Yeah. You mentioned a financial crash. Mm -hmm. um, you, you penned a piece, in, or you interviewed, in the Irish Times mm -hmm. on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned the financial crash. I just want to read mm -hmm. what you wrote mm -hmm. and just take your view on it, if I may. Okay, well, if I said it, I hope it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the journalist who wrote it here as well, so we can drag <laughs> up on stage. Um, you said in some recent research that you've done, and this surfaced to your surprise. The loyalty of their people, the fact that they worked together for so long and weren't prepared to give up, is what got them through the crisis. The exact opposite to the gig economy. How can we create the social capital, create loyalty, as the contingent workforce mm. and shorter term transient workers mm. rises? It's really hard. I mean, the first thing I will say is it's really hard and it's important to understand if you're, ru if you're running a business or a leader in a business which uses a lot of contingent workers. Yeah. If you want loyalty and responsibility, you're going to have to work much harder at it because the social contract is weaker. Right? If I'm not going to give you any security, I'm not going to give you any safety, um, then for you to trust me, mm. it's going to be really hard. Mm. Um, so I think the first thing I'd say is I'm not sure it can be done. Okay. I think if it is going to be done, <laughs> it's only going to be if the nature of the employment is just, so is it fair or is it exploitative? Is the nature of the employment really open and honest? And is everybody treated with respect? Because I think if you fulfill those conditions, you have a chance. If, like Mark Ashley at Sports Direct, you employ people in such conditions that they have to wear nappies to go to the toilet because they don't have enough time in their shift. Or you have women giving birth to babies in the toilet because they couldn't afford not to go into work that day. You're not going to have any loyalty at all. And if you think that's okay because it makes you tons of money, well, that's fine, but you have to realize you will never have a choice of workers. Be human. Well, I, I mean, try saying that to Mike Ashley, but... Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's, it, the social contract is a contract. If you give me little, I'll give you little. And it's not about the money. It is to your point. It's about, if, I, if you treat me like a human, I'll respond like a human. 
If you treat me like a disposable piece of garbage, that's how I'm going to treat you. Because well you've set the terms. Well said. We've Monica Lewinsky this afternoon. Mm. I know you're, you're, you're friends with Monica. Yeah. Um, she's going to tell a story about human compassion mm. and resilience mm. in the digital age. I would love to get your view on resilience. Mm. And I saw you, you quote this, and I'll just read it out to you, and I'll ask you for your view on it, Margaret of May. When you're speaking about resilience and friendship, and it's important for mm. us to sustain change, mm. resilience is very important. You describe it as the power to keep going when things get difficult, the ability to absorb pain, doubt, confusion, anxiety, the ability to see there are reasons to keep going. Mm. How come you constantly give our people that reason to keep going? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I do some work with a bit major retailer in the UK. And they did a really, you know, we've had an epidemic of mental illness in the UK. And everybody's saying, oh, we need more healthcare workers. No, we don't. We have to start treating people better. Um, but anyway, this retailer did a big survey because they were really concerned about mental illness. And what they found across the whole workforce, when they asked them, you know, what, what makes your working life uncomfortable here? 70% of people said loneliness. That's horrible. Imagine going into work and feeling lonely. I think that's, I mean, I'm just, I'm still kind of trying to figure out what this means. Um, it definitely means when the chips are down, it'll be hard to keep going, because it's hard to keep going if you feel alone. Um, I, t I teach on a leadership program, which is what I'm doing tomorrow, and at one point, um, I kind of, I don't know why, I, well, I do know why I did this. I sort of threw my toys out the pram and said, we need to have a session on friendship. And everybody looked at me like, Margaret, this is a program about leadership. Why do we need to talk about friendship? Well, we need to, because you don't get it, right? Um, and we brought in two really big C CEOs who talked really brilliantly about the crises they had gone through and how the only thing that kept them going was their friends. And, um, and, you know, as you know, for me, that's quite a big deal, because it's certainly the only thing that's kept me going at times of real difficulty in my own life. But afterwards, I took some of the um, participants in the leadership course. So these are kind of rising senior execs for a walk. And they all said, you know, we used to have friends, but we don't anymore. Because, you know, between work, which is all ours, and kids and family, there's just no time. So all our friends from university or from childhood or whatever lost touch with them. This is terrible. I mean, this is really terrible. And if you want to explain an epidemic of mental illness, you know, you might not need to go any further than that. And I think, you know, the workplace in which people feel they can't have friends, they mustn't have friends, there's no time for friends, they're competing with people who might otherwise be friends. You know, these are really destructive cultures. And I think, you know, this is a difficult message because everybody thinks friendship's really soft. So in my nerdy kind of way, <laughs> I thought, okay, let's, let's get to the bottom of this. You know, so Sunday I found myself reading Aristotle because he's apparently the big honcho on friendship. And he's really straightforward about it. He says it's the single most important thing in life. It makes everything else work. Well said. And it comes back to this thing about you see who you are reflected in the eyes of your friends. Well, can I reflect something to you, Margaret, in the spirit of friendship? Without knowing it, mm. you've been a friend of this conference. <laughs> And we've taken huge inspiration you. in your, from your thinking mm. and have applied it to our purpose to create better working lives, mm. to enrich the fabric of the workplace where those mm. people work, through the changing world of work. And I, I'm a firm believer that that has seeped into our organization at Sigmar, and I believe we are a better business for mm. it. I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.